good evening ladies and gentlemen i am dr sajit tedrisinga uh, secretary sri lanka medical association so as uh, the expert committee of uh, disaster resilience and management uh, of slma i would like to welcome you all for this important topic uh, today we are going to discuss on the temperature changes in future are we ready to face the challenges so today as our resource uh, persons uh, dr shiromini jawardana and uh, mr premalal will be joining with us so to moderate the discussion i would like to cordially invite dr lahiru koditwaku who is a council member uh, of slma uh, to start the discussion over to you lahiru thank you dr sanjit uh, good evening everyone uh, and welcome you all to the uh, this uh, webinar on uh, temperature changes in future are we ready to face the challenges uh, it is no secret that uh, the impacts of climate change have reached us globally as well as locally in sri lanka as well so we have been seeing uh, different kinds of extreme weather events uh, high rainfall changes in the monsoonal patterns um drought and we have been seeing it all so so what are the reasons behind these changes and what are the impacts of the, these changes uh, now uh, the month of april is typically uh, considered as the warmest uh, month in sri lanka because of the uh, positioning of the sun directly over the indian ocean uh, this country uh, this year sri lanka experienced uh, heat conditions in april come in april and may compared to other years very high heat conditions uh, in april and may uh, prompting meteorology department as well as ministry of health to issue uh, warnings to general public as well so so we are experiencing it all so so we need to have a better discussion or evidence based discussion about the changes that we are Uh, facing and what are the impacts of these changes especially uh, to human health uh, so in this backdrop uh, the disaster resilience and management uh, subcommittee expert committee of sri lanka medical association thought of uh, doing this uh, webinar to educate you all about these uh, impacts of these uh, extreme weather events especially temperature changes what are the impacts in future as well so i would like to welcome you all to this uh, important webinar and today we have two eminent speakers uh, let me introduce uh, uh, the first speaker our first speaker is uh, mr k h m s premalal uh, mr k m h premalal uh, holds a bachelor of uh, bachelor of uh, physics degree from university of peradeniya and a master degree in physics from the same university he also holds a master degree in meteorology from the reedy university united kingdom uh, then he uh, joined the meteorology department in uh, 1988 during his uh, illustrious career at the department of meteorology he was working as an expert on seasonal weather predictions climate change activities meteorological training activities drought monitoring and preparing tools for weather predictions and awareness activities Uh, he also uh, joined the sark meteorological research center uh, in dhaka bangladesh and had a very illustrious career in this uh, prestigious institution as well uh, he was appointed as the director general of meteorology in june 2017 and he hold, held the position until his retirement uh, in uh, 2018 so today he will be uh, discussing about are we are you, are we are you ready to uh, adapt to extreme high temperatures in future uh, over to you mr sarat premalal for the first session and a kind uh, uh, reminder for all the participants uh, we will be having the uh, two uh, sessions back to back and after the end of two sessions we will be having a q and a session for uh, 10 minutes you can uh, inbox your uh, uh, questions and any queries to us and our speakers will answer them in the Q&A session over to you mr premala yeah good evening and thank you very much uh, dr lahiru and dr sajid so as a starting point i would like to uh, i i would like to talk about are you ready to adopt extremely high temperature in future 
So under this topic, uh, these are the three talking points uh, what I'm going to talk. So the first one is, uh, what are the months you feel warm condition? And the other one, compared to the history, do you get much warm condition during the recent past? And the final one I'm going to uh, focus for the, uh, will you expect more warm condition in future? So the answer first one is, sorry. So this is the answer actually. So usually we get warm condition in March and April and it continue, you know, that until May, June, right? So this is, you know, that uh, the first graph uh, shows, you know, that global radiation, how, what, you know, the, how much we, uh, global radiation we received in Colombo. So you can see generally March and April, we received the higher uh, amount of global radiation. That is the main reason we are getting, you know, that much warmer condition during uh, the first intermon that is first intermon soon, you know, that when we talk about, you know, that the climate season, uh, that is, that is the base re main reason. So we are getting more warmer condition uh, during March and April. So then the uh, monsoon start in May and with the monsoon actually we get uh, the cold, I mean not cold actually, the, I mean that uh, not uh, much high warmer condition. And then again, Southwest, uh, South, second intermonsoon, we don't feel much uh, uh, higher temperature and Northeast monsoon season, we get some cool condition. So this is, you know, that temperature, average temperature at Colombo, that maximum temperature and uh, Andradapura. So you can see even uh, uh, Colombo and Andradapura, even you know that see other, other places also, March and April, usually you get higher temperature. So the more radiation and warm <coughs> during first winter monsoon, the, the, the other reason is you know that we don't get much higher wind. The wind is very calm and as a, uh, oceanic countries, so we get, uh, we, uh, especially, you know, that coastal re region, the moisture is rich due to sea breeze and uh, less rain during uh, March, April. So those are the main, main reason. So we get higher temperature during March and April. Uh, so the uh, next uh, point is compared to the history, do you get much warm condition during re recent past? The answer is yes. The main reason is global warming. You know, uh, the, uh, the IPCC Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the fifth assessment uh, report uh, indicated. So global, uh, the globally, the temperature has been uh, increased by 0 0.85 for the for the period 1988 to 2012. So AR6, when you see the, uh, when you read the AR6, I mean the sixth uh, assessment report from that very recently published. So the temperature increase much higher than the, uh, higher than this one, actually this is up to 2012. Uh, so this is, uh, and you can see the graph, uh, the right hand graph, the, the bottom one. So actually uh, 1980, since 1980, uh, the temperature has been increased very dramatically, right? So you can see, you know, that very clearly. And even in Sri Lanka, so the temperature increase in rate is almost similar. So this is uh, 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 the increase in temperature in Kalam, uh, in Sri Lanka, the average temperature. So you can see the global, it has been uh, increased by 0 0.85 degree for the nearly 100 years. And even Sri Lanka, it is 0 0.9 degree. So you can see, you can say, you know, that the temperature has been increased by one degree Celsius. For, for the last 100 years. So that is the average value, uh, average increases, increase value. But with that one degree Celsius, so we get uh, more, I mean, that extreme temperature condition, right? So that is, you know, that we can explain, you know, that the bottom graph. So we are getting, we are, we are collecting data for daily, daily, daily data for maximum temperature. When we uh, fit, in, uh, fit the data into uh, standard normal distribution, so it like this one, right? So the the middle mid, uh, middle uh, middle point uh, indicate the average one, average uh, value, and the other one, other other data is actually the left hand and right hand side side. So when we just uh, get the value below 90, 90th percentile, and uh, more than uh, nine, uh, sorry, uh, more than 90th percentile Thailand uh, below 10 percentile. So those values are. Uh, basically, we uh, defined as extreme values. 
right? So you can see how uh, the amount of uh, extreme value we, we received, you know, that uh, for the general, I mean, that for a general standard normal distribution curve. But now what we say, what, what has happened? So earlier, uh, the, the middle one shows, you know, that uh, the different two season, two period actually, maybe 1951 to 1980, and maybe to the 1981 to 2010 or 2020. So you can see, uh, the previous, I mean, that earlier average value indicate, you know, that first graph, first standard normal distribution graph, and the second period values, you know, that represent the second uh, second graph. So you can see the uh, average has been increased by, you know, that certain amount, right? And these are the, uh, I mean, that, uh, the, so you can see the red color and uh, the uh, orange color. So those are the extreme value. So you can see, you know, that uh, the extreme value also increasing with the increase in temperature because uh, the standard normal distribution curve shifted towards uh, right hand side. So this is the values obtained. I mean, that obtained in Sri Lanka. Actually, I got it, uh, got this one from World Bank Climate Web Portal. This is for Sri Lanka. As you can see, the yellow yellow graph shows 1951 to 80, uh, 1980. So you can see some extreme values, you know, that at the bottom. And the second graph, 1971 to 2000, 2000, and the other one actually, 1980 to 2020. So you can see how the extreme values increase during the recent past. So that is the main reason we are getting, you know, that more warm condition uh, at present compared to the, uh, I mean, that other periods like, you know, the 1980, maybe 1960. So this is the main, uh, main reason. Right. So uh, actually, Med Department uh, started to issue heat, uh, rela heat related warning in 2017. So then, actually, the, the 2017, so we had a SASCOP meeting, South Asia Seasonal Climate Outlook Forum meeting. It was held in Sri Lanka. And there was a separate forum for climate and health uh, in the SASCOP meeting. So forum focused to heat wave in Asian region. So actually all heat, uh, Asian region countries are participating for this uh, SASCOP meeting. So WHO and WMO requested all South Asian countries to prepare heat health action plan. The main reason is heat related, heat -related portal is one of the most hazardous disaster. So that is what we call the silent killers. So Med Department in Sri Lanka, we started uh, to issue uh, heat related warnings uh, since 2000, I think 2007 actually we started, but since 2016, after the SASCOP meeting, Sri Lanka started to issue uh, heat, uh, heat wave prediction. But still, actually, uh, it was not indicated in the uh, disaster management plan as uh, uh, high temperature is, you know, that one of the disaster. So I think now that uh, now it is a time to include uh, heat related hazards for this act. Right. So what is a heat wave? Just we look at you know that what is heat wave. So there is no universal definition for a heat wave. So the, you know the different different countries use you know that different uh, definitions. But you know that uh, I got uh, this one from Wikipedia. A heat wave is a prolonged period of excessively hot weather, which may be accompanied by high humidity. So when the temperature combined with the heat, uh, humidity, so we feel more uh, hot condition. So that is actually, uh, you know, that some countries use as a heat waves. Even Sri Lanka, we use the same. So this is especially in the oceanic climate countries like you know, the Sri Lanka. So uh, surrounded Sri Lanka is surrounded by ocean. So uh, when we uh, just go to the ocean, I mean that uh, the coastal area, so we get more uh, humidity. But when we, uh, I mean that come to the central area, the humidity is less compared to the coastal area. So we don't feel much higher warm condition in central area, but coastal area, we, we, we feel you know, that have a much higher warm condition that is because of high humidity. So high humidity is, you know, that one of the reason to feel much warmer condition, right? So these are the basic, uh, ba actually basically there are three approaches uh, to identify heat. These are the uh, three approaches. The one is simplified biometrological indices. 
So under that, there are six. The one is heat index. Actually, many departments Sri Lanka use heat index, and you know that most of the countries like USA uh, also use the same thing. And the other one, humidex, net effective uh, temperature, that is percentile based temp uh, temperatures, what I explained you know, that earlier. And the other one, wet bulb global temperature, the apparent temperature, and excess heat index, that also percentile based. So for this, this actually, we need only meteorological parameters. And to verify it, we need some cl uh, clinical evidence. But in Sri Lanka, I don't think uh, so. We have more cl uh, clinical evidence. But we can, uh, I'm very sure, we can uh, uh, modify the heat index, what we are using at present, if we have clin more clinical evidence. And the other one, heat budget model. So for that, actually, there are five standard effective temperature, predicted uh, mean value, perceived temperature, the uh, physiological equivalent temperature, universal thermal uh, climate uh, index. Th th this is not uh, very easy to calculate because you know that these need meteorological parameters, biological parameters, and also heat balance. And the other one, holistic approach. So we are not, I mean, that uh, countries like uh, the tropical countries actually not much use these uh, approaches. Uh, uh, those are, you know, that air mass, cloud, wind-based approach, surface pressure variation. So this is basically uh, based on uh, the wind uh, synoptic situation. That is, you know, that the protein, you know, that temperature, pressure, and others. And we can we can just see, you know, that what is synoptic station. So basically, this condition used by the middle latitude country. So just I explained, you know, that what is air mass. I think you remember the 2003 European heat wave. So many people died. So that is because of uh, this one, the uh, movement of air mass uh, to the European region. So you can see the first uh, graph, uh, first picture. So especially over the uh, mid latitude countries, I mean that like European countries and others. So they are getting you know, that much rain uh, with the warm and the, with the combine, combine of warm and cold air masses. When the warm air masses, comes to you know that particular certain area so that area get you know that more, uh, more warm but uh, luckily actually it will not uh, last in for a longer time few days actually so after few days you know that again you know that cold air mass comes right so not like uh, they i mean that uh, the tropical countries so even you know that they get uh, the uh, heat wave like uh, with the uh, air masses uh, it will not last in you know that for a long long time but the impact will be much higher because they are not uh, much adapted to, adapted to the high temperatures. And this is the heat index. You know that the heat index is a combination of, you know, of air temperature and relative humidity. That is uh, how hot it actually feels, right? Uh, it, uh, heat, heat index is widely used in the USA and is effective when the temperature is greater than 26 Celsius and relative humidity is at least uh, 40%. So this is the equation that we have to apply. We have to apply uh, temperature and uh, relative humidity, and we have to calculate uh, what is heat index, right? So these are the graphs uh, for different. Uh, so you can see, you can compare. You know that how the heat index, uh, the value of uh, how the heat index values are changes with the temperature. That is what I uh, I mean. That insert this graph. Actually, I prepared today this one to show how much uh, temperature is getting increase with the, temp, uh, with the uh, relative humidity. So this is ambient temperature, 32, 33, you can see 32, 33, the 40, 33, 34, 35, like that, 40. So if the temp, uh, temperature is 32 and the uh, relative humidity is 50, so we feel like maybe 35, 36 temperature. So you can see uh, the first point. But if the temperature is 32 and the relative humidity is 100, right? That means, you know, that uh, the 100% uh, moisture. So we feel like, you know, that 52. So you can see the graph, 52. That means that uh, the value, the temperature value increased by nearly 18 degrees. So this is the effect of relative humidity for different temperatures. So just look at, you know, that uh, even, you know, that uh, the Sri Lankan temperature is average 33 or 34, sometimes you get uh, higher temperature like you know, that 38, 39. Uh, so I think uh, Dr. Shiromani will explain you know, that uh, what are the temperatures, you know, that high temperatures we received in this year. So I'm sure some areas uh, we received 38, 39 
temperatures. So if the temperature is 40, the ambient temperature is 40 and the relative humidity is 50, so we feel like, you know, that 55. But when the, uh, if the uh, uh, RH is 100, so we feel like, you know, that 100. So that is the effect of relative humidity for the, uh, to feel, you know, that the warming condition. So based on the values actually, so they are, the, the, and that this is, uh, this is prepared by the USA. Uh, so there is a criteria for declare, uh, de uh, declare the heat wave. So you can see uh, the top bar shows you know, the temperature and the other one uh, relative humidity. So you can see you know, that uh, you can see the values, values, I mean that the heat index values and also relative humidity and temperature how we are we are issuing i mean that mid department issuing uh, different uh, different uh, uh, warning based on the uh, based on this right so when it is you know that uh, uh, yellow color it is caution extreme caution and danger extreme danger these are the things actually these are the four categories uh, for issue uh, high heat condition right so you can see when issue the warning like you know that uh, caution so these are the possible impact the fatigue is possible with prolonged exposure and activity uh, activity continue uh, activity could result in heat cramps the other one uh, extreme extreme portion right that is 32 to 41 heat index so this is the impact heat cramps and heat exhaustion are possible and continuing activity could result in heat strokes and when it you know that comes to danger, the heat cramps or heat exhaustion likely and heat strokes and with prolonged exposure and or physical activities. So the final one, heat stroke is imminent. I am I am not aware about the heat stroke and others, but I think uh, the most of you are doctors. You know you know what is this, and this is actually what I have done for one of the report, right? Uh, using the temperature, actual temperature, average temperature and the average relative humidity for particular area, particular landscape, you know, that goal, Putlam, uh, Manan, uh, Trincomalee. So you can see how the, I mean, that uh, the heat indices are changes uh, with the, for different decades, 1961, 1972, 2011, and 2020. So you can see uh, out of these, you know, that four landscape, the Trincomalee is, you know, that one of the most uh, vulnerable uh, area for the uh, high heat index. And the last one, now you can understand you know, that uh, now we are getting more, I mean, that uh, the present situation. So the finally, I'm going to focus my uh, discussion, I mean, my talk uh, for the, will you expect more warm condition in future? For that, actually, you need to know the global warming and what is the reason for global warming? That is, you know, that basically emission of greenhouse gas and what is greenhouse gas and what is what are the greenhouse gas and what is greenhouse effect? I'm not going to explain uh, these uh, greenhouse gases and greenhouse effect, I know. So you all know about this one, but I would like to focus my uh, presentation for this one. This is very important. So this is since 1750, that is, you know, that pre-industrial era. So we started to, uh, get, I mean that calculate the warming condition uh, since 1750. So we just uh, uh, imagine, I mean that we just uh, imagine uh, the 1750, the radiative force in the radiative force in is uh, when you combine greenhouse gas effect and you know that uh, the solar radiation and uh, change of uh, land use. So when you, uh, when you I mean that, uh, so you know, even you know that the land use changes also impact for the global warming. So when you, uh, I mean that uh, combine all those effects actually, for that actually we call the radiative force in values. So you can see uh, the, the radiative force in value for the different uh, emission of, uh, I mean that emission of different greenhouse gases and also for the radi uh, solar radiation and also uh, with you know that other aerosols like nitrogen and nitrous oxide uh, so nit uh, no x actually nit uh, nitrogen dioxide so when you know that when aerosols comes to the uh, goes to the atmosphere we get some cooling effect and uh, nitrous nitrous oxide actually we get uh, the uh, green i mean that uh, warming 
effect. So when you calculate, you know that when you summarize all these things, you know, the present uh, uh, radio to forcing value is 2.29, that is 2011 uh, radio to forcing value. So 1750 radio to forcing value is zero. So you can see the uh, table. 1750 actually radiative force in values uh, zero watts per meter square. It increased uh, for 0 0.57 in 1950 and 1980. It is it was a 1.25 and the present actually nearly 2000 2.29. So you can see the graph below. So the present value is 2.25. How the radiative force in force in is increasing. So you can see the graph. So now we need some you know that. Uh, what, what do you call that? Uh, some stories for the future, right? We, we can tell some stories. If we emit more carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases to the country, uh, to the atmosphere, what will happen, right? Without any control, we can emit uh, greenhouse gases. So that is a story, right? And you know that we can control emission of carbon dioxide, right? That is, you know, that just we align with the uh, Paris Agreement. So we can we can go for zero emission by 1950, and what what we can see what what we can predict you know that uh, how we can pre predict the radiative forcing. So these are the four uh, radiative forcing values predicted according to those uh, I mean that stories. So this is actually stories. Uh, I am not going to tell tell this one, right? That is what uh, so, uh, that is what I explain now, and uh, so. RCP 8.5 means representative concentration pathway. That is uh, 8.5 indicate the radiative force in values 8.5 by 2100. That is without control, uh, without control in emission of greenhouse gas. And you know that uh, changes of land use, land use changes like that. But when we control it, so we can just go for RCP 4.5. That is what we call moderate emission scenario and the RCP 8.5 is high emission zero scenario. Actually 2.6 is when we mitigate emission, right? So we can just go for 2.6 level, but it will not happen, right? So we can, we can, you know, that we can stop emission of greenhouse gas. So that means we can, we can reach, you know, that 2.6, at least we, we, we should try to uh, go for our RCP 4.5. This is according to AR5, that is the assessment report, fifth assessment report under IPCC. Right. So these are the expected temperature by uh, 2100 for different four scenarios, different uh, four uh, representation, uh, representative concentration pathways. So you can see. By 2100, if we emit more carbon dioxide and greenhouse gas without, without any control, right? The climate policy associated with scenarios, we are not, uh, I mean, that uh, in line with the uh, climate policies and others. So temperature can be increased by 73.7. This is global, but it can be uh, between, it will be 2006 and uh, 4.8, 4 right? So, if, if we can control the emission of greenhouse gas, we can just go for 1.8 degrees, nearly two degrees Celsius by 2100. So these are the expected temperature for different four scenarios under AR5, right? So Med Department Sri Lanka also conducted uh, uh, conducted research to identify the uh, temperatures in 2050, 2100, etc. Uh, et uh, using uh, six uh, model, six glo global model, model, that is next NASA model. And these are the results. So increase in temperature under RCP 4.4, that is uh, the radiative force in 4.5 representative concentra concentration pathway. So you can see by 2050, uh, temperature can be increased by 1.7 in Sri Lanka, right? And 2081 to 2100, that is maybe 2090, uh, the temperature can, can be increased by 2.3 by 4.5. So now you can see how we feel, uh, I mean, that uh, heat, when we combine with the, uh, I mean, that uh, relative humidity. So now, now we are feeling actually for one degree Celsius increase. But when it comes to 1.7 in 2050, 
so you can just imagine you know that how we feel you know that uh, the warm condition right so we get you know that more extreme events and we feel you know that more uh, warm condition uh, events right so when uh, we go for 8.5 scenario that you know that we, if we uh, not uh, stop you know that i'm not actually mitigate uh, emission of uh, greenhouse gas so what will happen the temperature can be increased by 2.6 or 2.0 in 2000 uh, 2050 and it will be 2 3.7 in 2090 so this is just average temperature annual average temperature increase in sri lanka right but i just wanted to uh, i mean that uh, check you know that how much uh, temperature will be increased for different season why so we know the first inter monsoon season we get high temperature compared to the other uh, months so under that actually i i just got you know that uh, this results <clears throat> this is jaffna uh, actually i have done you know that different district so you can see the first inter monsoon even during 2050, 2050, during uh, first inter monsoon season, the temperature can be uh, increased by 3.0 degree. So that is 2.3, uh, 2.8 means to that nearly 3.0 during the first inter monsoon. But uh, southeast monsoon, it will be little less. And uh, second inter monsoon and uh, northeast monsoon, uh, it is not that much, right? So the first inter monsoon and uh, southeast monsoon season much vulnerable uh, for you know that even we uh, go for RCP 4.5, right? When it I mean that when we uh, uh, when it is you know that uh, this is maximum temperature when it is, it is RCP 8.5, it is much higher. So you can see it is much higher, right? So these are the expected uh, expected. Uh, uh, heat index value for different uh, for landscape in Sri Lanka. So it's also I done, I have done for that same uh, project, right? You can see, you know, that how temperature, how heat index is increasing in Sri Lanka for different, uh, different places uh, for different two scenarios, right? Right. So the final actually, I would like to uh, focus my, uh, presentation for are you ready to adapt extremely high temperature in future so you can understand we get to you know that more extreme condition in future so what we can do actually we how will we have to adapt for this uh, high high temperature uh, events right so these are the actual impact we uh, we get actually actually these are basically you know that the health health uh, uh, health uh, related one uh, so I got from you know that the internet and others. So what it what is heat uh, stress? Heat stress is a variety of condition condition where the body is under stress from overheating. It can include heat rash, sunburn, heat cramps, fainting, heat exhaustion, and heat strokes. And heat stress can also be fatal. So people at a greater risk of heat stresses are those heat stress are those who are physically unfit suffer from heart uh, diseases and consume alcohol, overweight, are not sufficiently acclimatized, acclimatized or are required or uh, wear excessive clothing, like, you know, that police and others, you know, that they, excessive, they wear excessive cloth and, you know, they are exposed, completely exposed for the, uh, I mean, that uh, uh, radiation. So th th those people are very much vulnerable. And the six main factors are involved with heat stress at a workplace or school. The one is actually temperature. If no AC, so they are more vulnerable from uh, heat stresses. And the uh, the places where where you know that you get high high humidity. And the other one, radiant temperature surrounding air movements. So like you know that uh, like you know like a city like like cities. So they are movement are very less, you know, that with the buildings and others. So those areas are actually highly vulnerable. And the other one, cloth, you know, as I said, you know, that uh, if, if you need, if you wear, you know, that more excessive clothing or, you know, that even uh, some cloth, you know, that uh, not uh, reflecting uh, the radiation. So those are not good for uh, heat stress and the physical activity of workers, of workers. 
And so we have to identify actually risk communities to adapt for the high heat. So what occupation are at risk? This is very important. The operations involve in, high, involve in higher air temperatures, radiant heat uh, sources, high humidity, direct physical contact with hot objects, or sternous physical activities have a high potential for including heat stress in employees in such places as commercial kitchens, you know, like Kotubas and Hopper bars, they are much vulnerable. They are working with, you know, that uh, high temperatures and laundries. So they are working in, you know, that hot uh, uh, climate and uh, bakeries, not, you know, that uh, the present one, I mean, that uh, latest one, the old fashioned key. Uh, kiln and broilers like you know that electrical utilities and out day operation conducted in hot weather such as constructions refining asbestos removal roofing road repair farming and hazardous waste activities especially those that uh, require workers to wear non uh, breathing protective clothing are likely to cause heat stress among exposed workers and these are the uh, uh, communities, you know, that uh, there is communities, especially elderly people, the young people, sick people, and urban communities, outdoor workers, poor people, and beggars. Those are the, uh, I mean, that community who are uh, much vulnerable for the uh, high temperatures. And finally, uh, I just explained you know, that how do you prevent heat stresses? So, employers and also employees should consider all of the following items in order to help reduce the likelihood of heat stress. Responsibilities of employers, right? Actually, we have to include these things for labor rules, right? So, but I am still actually, those are not included. Actually, the laborers are much vulnerable uh, because of that. To increase uh, workers' awareness of how to recognize, uh, recognize the symptoms of heat stress and preventive measures. I'm very sure. So those kind of things actually not conducted in Sri Lanka. I don't think you know that uh, I, till I just uh, mentioned five out of five, even you know that one has not been uh, implemented. The other one should identify potential heat stress areas and protect workers by providing necessary control measures, right? So we have to think about that. And the other one, cool drinking water should be accessible to workers. Right, the provide fans, ventilators, exhaust system, and air condition system to control the workplace temperature. Right, it also it also not you know that in Colombia actually the most of the places uh, are now using uh, uh, air condition. But when you go to uh, some you know that uh, what is that uh, rural area, still they are working without uh, proper ventilation and also uh, air condition. And the other one should either, either allow workers to follow a work rest schedule or reduce their activity level during hot periods. So we have to think as an employer, so we have to think, for, think about these things. Actually, there are maybe, there may be, you know, many that we have, I mean, especially, you know, that the working period also, what I'm thinking, the working period also should change. Like, you know, that the people were working at the uh, daytime outside uh, during the daytime. So we can change it as you know that uh, they uh, to work at, at night time. So it is possible actually, right? The other one responsibilities of employee: uh, drink a cup of water. So every thirty minutes is recommended. So we need to uh, we need to aware the uh, people to do this and check with your doctor before working if you are taking medications, and take rest break uh, take take rest breaks in cool areas. Wear clothing that is loose fit fit in if allowed, but like, you know, that police actually, they are not allowed. So tightly woven and light colored in outdoor. Uh, yeah, so outdoor, uh, sorry, out, uh, order to reflect heat uh, rather, rather than as, uh, absorb it. And the final one, outdoor workers should also know the hazards of UV radiation and effective uh, protective measures. Right, those are some uh, some you know that responsibilities. But uh, I think last one actually not uh, much relevant to Sri Lanka. So we are not that much. Uh, I mean that uh, vulnerable from the UV radiation. So 
yeah, this is my presentation. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Premalal. Thank you for the uh, comprehensive presentation. And indeed, it was an eye opener for uh, all of us, especially the medical practitioners who have uh, joined this uh, session. Thank you for the comprehensive presentation. And thank you for highlighting some of the uh, key areas. Uh, now, uh, the lack of uh, high heat related uh, disasters or crises uh, in the list of uh, disasters in the Disaster Management Act and something for the policymakers to think about. Yeah. And also introducing these scenarios, uh, what are the future scenarios? I think uh, that was an uh, eye-opener for all of us. Thank you very much for highlighting these issues. I, I think uh, many of us have uh, many questions. I, I think we can uh, uh, get those questions during the Q&A session. Uh, okay, thank you, thank Mr. Ramlal. Uh, yeah. If you can kindly unshare the screen, I think the next person. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, we can move on to the uh, second speaker. Our second speaker is uh, Dr. Shiromani Jayavardhana, who is currently acting as the Director with the Forecasting and Decision Support uh, Department of Meteorology. Uh, she holds a BSc in Physics from University of Peradeniya, PG Diploma in Satellite Meteorology and Global Climate from Center for Space Science and Technology, Education in Asia and Pacific. Also, she holds a MSc in Meteorology from the University of Hawaii, USA, and, uh, and a PhD from the Open University of Sri Lanka. She has more than 24 years of experience uh, in the field of meteorology. She has been a member of uh, several prestigious organizations and research institutes uh, affiliated to meteorology. Uh, she's a member of the Technical Steering Committee of Southeast Asia Climate Outlook Forum as well. Uh, she has been, uh, she has extend, uh, she has extensive uh, uh, research uh, collaborations and publications, more than 25 research papers and three book chapters as well. Uh, so she will be uh, discussing about uh, heat waves, present status, future projections, and possible warning methods. Dr. Shiromi, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lahiru. Uh, good evening. And uh, I'm going to talk about heat waves, present status, future projection, and uh, present early warning method. So some of my slides are repetition of uh, Mr. Premla, so I will skip those things. Uh, and Okay, so uh, outline is what I think Mr. Premla already explained. Actually, I wanted to show you that uh, what we recently experienced during month of uh, 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 April and May, uh, is it a heat wave or uh, any other influence from the global uh, conditions or a current uh, uh, early warning system we have for heat early warning system and uh, future projections of heat waves. Um, Mr. Raymond, I'll discuss about the heat uh, index, but I'm talking about heat waves. Uh, so uh, like Mr. Raymond, I mentioned, so this is the uh, maximum temperature uh, maps uh, that climate logical maps. Uh, so you can see April, May is the uh, hottest month. Uh, and uh, this, uh, the other one, this one is the uh, wind pattern, uh, 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 that climate logical wind pattern across Sri Lanka. So we can see uh, from May to September, we have southwest monsoon. So we have some um, uh, wind across Sri Lanka, but uh, uh, March, April, uh, we have very calm wind. Again, uh, uh, October, November also calm wind, but uh, October, uh, November, we experienced a lot of uh, low pressure systems in the Bay of Bengal compared to the uh, March, April, October, November, somewhat uh, wind is uh, somewhat stronger. Uh, so uh, with this uh, calm winds and high temperatures, uh, usually our envir environment is uh, uh, humid because uh, wind is calm. Uh, so uh, that's why the feeling temperature is um, much more than the environment temperature. Uh, so heat wave, like Mr. Min, uh, Premalal mentioned, there's no universal definition for heat wave. Uh, but according to the World Meteorological Organization, uh, so uh, the maximum temperature, the uh, 30 average from 1961 to 1990, if that uh, Climatological average exceed by 
five degrees for five consecutive days, uh, they consider that as a heat wave. Uh, but uh, like uh, uh, Mr. Premala mentioned, like uh, with maximum temperature, if we have high humidity, especially like oceanic climate countries, uh, we feel very uh, warm, hot uh, conditions. Uh, so, uh, recent, this is a uh, month of April uh, temperature values. So you can see we have like uh, about 30, some we can see about 36 degree uh, maximum temperature, some areas, but the anomaly, anomaly is the departure from long-term mean that from 1961 to 1990. So most of them did not, none of them actually did not exceed for five degrees, but there are some like three point, nearly four degree, uh, but not for consecutive five days. So. According to the World Meteorological Organization, it's not a heat wave, but there are some other definitions also, like uh, Mr. Premala mentioned about the 90th percentile. So maximum temperature uh, values are above 90th percentile for three consecutive days. That also considered as a heat wave. Uh, so this is the comparison of uh, temperature, maximum temperature uh, during April 2023 and 22. So you can see this is the April 20, uh, 2023. So more, except the first week, most of the remaining uh, days, we have uh, above normal temperatures. That means uh, the, uh, the climate logic value is zero, uh, but above normal temperatures or most of our uh, meteorological stations. But in uh, April 2020, we can see there are a lot of below normal uh, temperatures uh, during month of April. And then when we consider the month of May, so this is the uh, maximum temperature anomaly during May 2020. So you can see first week we had some above normal temperatures, but after that uh, we can see below normal temperatures. But in its opposite in May 2023, first week we have some below normal temperatures, but after uh, 15th uh, May, so most of the stations reported above normal temperature. So this is the onset of southwest monsoon. Usually when uh, uh, the general public ask, uh, media ask us uh, uh, when this uh, heat, heat condition will, uh, how long it will last, we said that until the monsoon established across Sri Lanka. So this is in 2022 actually, monsoon established, start to establish very early, like from 16th uh, May onwards, uh, start to establish, but this year, uh, it was delayed actually uh, uh, climate logical onset day is 25th may but this year from 31st onwards uh, it start to uh, develop but not very vigorous monsoon so this time we couldn't feel much strong winds also so this delay also one reason uh, we feel that warm conditions during the month of may so, and there are like inter year to year variations. Like, so this is the wind pattern, uh, climate logical wind pattern of month of April. This is the climate logical wind pattern during month of May. And this is uh, April 2020, uh, 2022. And this is April 2023. So you can see comparatively, we get more calm winds during April 2023. And May also, May 2022, we can see much stronger because I have used same color code for all the maps. Uh, so much stronger winds than compared to the 2023. So this uh, all together, we feel warm condition. In addition to that, in the Pacific Ocean, there was another phenomena developing that is El Nino. So El Nino, there are a lot of like media uh, concern about this El Nino. So these are some of the highlights. El Nino reappears and scientists expect a record high temperatures in 2023 because uh, when El Nino develops, uh, that is uh, equatorial Pacific Ocean uh, becoming warmer than uh, normal, <laughs> warmer than climate logic, more warm conditions over equatorial Pacific Ocean, <coughs> sorry. And this warming can feel all over the world. So most of the, uh, Highest temperature recorded years are associated with the uh, El Nino years. And uh, so th this is the prediction for El Nino uh, based on actually, uh, this is a recent one. So it is expected from uh, May, June, uh, May, June, July onwards, 
uh, El Nino uh, uh, is predicted till JFM, that is June, uh, January, February, March season in 2024. But uh, we don't know whether it will continue further. Uh, this uh, El Nino is very uh, unique because uh, we had like triple La Nina years from 2020, uh, uh, fall onwards, uh, La Nina conditions, that is unusual uh, cooling of the equatorial, uh, eastern equatorial Pacific, we experienced for three consecutive years, uh, 2020, 2021, and 2022. And then this cooling ended in uh, March 2003. And by May, uh, El Nino started. This is very rapid warming. And uh, this never happens before, very rapid warming. And scientists are actually shocked by this rapid warming. So they don't know because El Nino is a ocean atmospheric uh, phenomena, the coupled uh, phenomena. So how atmosphere will behave for this uh, rapid warming is not yet uh, predicted. So they are uh, expecting uh, some extreme events uh, this year. So this is how El Nino will impact our southwest monsoon rainfall. First one is the southwest monsoon rainfall. Usually, uh, we get less rain over the central parts of the island, especially where the hydropower, hydropower reservoir is located. And in October, November, our second intermonsoon, we get more rain. Uh, so this is the present uh, warming in the equatorial Pacific Ocean, and this is also the warming. Uh, so, uh, how La Nina and El Nino affect our global temperatures? Uh, so, uh, within any decades, the warmest years are associated with El Nino and coolest are associated with La Nina. So, you can see these uh, different decades. The warmest are red color El Nino year and coolest are associated with the La Nina year. And uh, this one is uh, the uh, global average temperature for January from 1950 to 2015. So it's the anomaly, the long departure from the long-term mean. So you can see all the red colors, uh, red uh, circles are represent El Nino years and blue circles are represent La Nina years. And there are two volcanic eruptions because like Mr. Pemeral also mentioned during volcanic eruption, there were a lot of aerosols emitted into the atmosphere. So these aerosols scattered in coming solar radiation and some sort of cooling can occur. So uh, 20, uh, this 2003, uh, there were like uh, extreme uh, El Nino events, three El Nino events so far, uh, except this year. Uh, so uh, in uh, 1983, there was a um, mega El Nino year and 1997, and other one is 2015, 2016. And this year also, they expected uh, some uh, uh, super El Nino year, but uh, it's a prediction, we don't know yet. Uh, so this, uh, uh, even though there was a volcanic eruption, the volcanic eruption reduced in coming radiation, some sort of cooling occurs, but El Nino effect is dominated. So uh, we, we got like higher anomalies. And uh, so uh, there are the blue colors are uh, associated with the uh, blue circles, Alanina years. So you can see El Nino is uh, usually get warmer temperatures. And you can see the effect of climate change. You can see in, within the year to year variations, you can see the increasing trend. So this is uh, El Nino, uh, that is unusual warming in the equatorial Pacific and unusual cooling in the equatorial Pacific Pole. Lanina. Uh, so other thing is, you, if you see the uh, Indian Ocean, Indian Ocean also very warm uh, these days. So that also uh, one reason we got warm is in the month of April as well as May, the Indian Ocean uh, has higher sea surface temperature. So this is the anomaly. Uh, so this one, you can see the sea surface temperature about 30 degrees and anomaly also positive. So that warming also affects our high uh, temperatures we experience during month of April and May. So then um, heat waves, even though we are not experiencing a lot of heat waves, so uh, what will be the uh, future projections, especially in Colombo, because Colombo is a city and uh, so people, a lot of uh, population density is very high. Uh, so uh, we also considered two emission scenarios, RCP 4.5 moderate emission scenario and 
8.5 high emission scenario. So uh, Mr. Premara showed us some uh, global uh, models. So we here we use uh, meteor uh, Japanese Meteorological Center uh, Research Center their model. So this is actually using all the models. Uh, so this uh, or Colombo, uh, uh, you can see how that. Uh, 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 from 2020 to 2040 and 24 to 2060 and 2070 uh, to 2090 maximum and minimum temperatures under uh, uh, moderate emission scenario and uh, high emission scenario, how it can change. And this is the heat wave. Here actually we consider uh, at least uh, three consecutive days, maximum temperature and minimum temperature as to be about 90th percentile. Uh, and then um, we found that heat wave duration, that is the uh, length of the longest heat wave um, uh, and a number of days that uh, heat wave occurs, that is the uh, heat wave frequency. So you can see heat wave frequency uh, is uh, increasing, especially after 2030. Uh, so uh, under high emission scenario as well as moderate emission scenario, so the wave duration also that is the uh, number of days that under the longest heat wave, uh, length of that longest heat wave. So it can be like last for two months under high emission scenario. So in addition to that, uh, like uh, we have the heat island effect. That heat island effect is that uh, this uh, uh, concrete uh, man-made surfaces, uh, it absorbs uh, solar radiation and re-emits and act, uh, retain that heat and re-emits the, to the atmosphere. So it acts act as a heat source. So that also uh, provide more heat into the whatever uh, the uh, environment uh, temperature, it gives more heat into the uh, environment. So this uh, uh, heat island effects also added some uh, extra heat into the environment. So, uh, Colombo, uh, I think uh, we have to be um, in future, we have to go for like in, increase the green space and, uh, uh, and uh, the heat preparedness to early warning system is also very important. So, Mr. Premara discussed about the, uh, the heat uh, index. So, right now we are using heat index to uh, prepare this uh, early warning. So this is the heat index. I think Ms. Framer already discussed this very in detail. So what we are doing, we run uh, with the research model as well as we have the access to the European Center for Medium Trend Forecast data. And then we uh, use this maximum temperature and relative humidity and we use this uh, equation. And uh, then we prepare this type of maximum temperature and uh, the uh, heat index uh, maps and uh, uh, these threshold values, if it exceeds these threshold values, so uh, we issue heat advisories. And uh, uh, these type of uh, like uh, this, uh, these are the threshold values and so action required. So we have actually, uh, like Mr. Premier mentioned, we started this in 2017. And uh, so Dr. Uh, Professor Rojai Singh and Dr. Inoka Sudhavira, uh, they were uh, frequently visited and, and we had discussions and finally uh, we uh, developed this early warning method. But we need to fine tune these values. Actually, we need to have uh, uh, that clinical evidence also and see these uh, values are really uh, give some uh, uh, meaningful values uh, or we can, because there are not much research has been conducted in this area, especially heat related studies are very limited in Sri Lanka. So I think uh, it's uh, uh, I think vast uh, area you can explore. Uh, and then uh, like Mr. Preman mentioned, uh, Disaster Management Act uh, 13 in 20, uh, 2005, heat, uh, high temperature, so heat waves are not considered as a hazard, but now uh, they are going to do amendment. So we propose include high temperature events uh, into this amendment. So in, in um, uh, this, with the amendment, it will be considered as a, uh, this uh, one of the hazard in the uh, disaster management act. Uh, so thank you very much.
Thank you, Dr. Shiromi. Thank you for the informative uh, presentation. I think a uh, uh, lot of technical details with uh, uh, very clear explanations as well. And thank you for highlighting the need for research on uh, heat waves and uh, heat effects, uh, especially on health impacts. I think uh, we have a lacuna there uh, in research. Thank you for highlighting these issues. Uh, if audience have any questions, I think this is the right time to uh, present your questions to our uh, speakers. You can unmute yourself and uh, present your question. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chiramini. I'm uh, Dr. Sajit here, uh, the secretary of uh, Just a small question. If somebody wants to conduct a research or do a collaborative research, what are the provisions? What are the facilities? What are the options that they can get and how they can contact you all and uh, how they can conduct a collaborative research with you all? Uh, yes, and thank you very much for raising this question. And uh, actually, we can provide maximum temperature uh, that this data, but heat, uh, because uh, when, the, when we run the model, actually we run for three kilometer resolution. So uh, it creates a very huge amount of data and uh, so because we don't have enough storage. So I don't think we uh, store these uh, our outputs, especially predictions uh, uh, for a longer period of time. Uh, but uh, I think uh, there are some uh, meteorologists who are interested in uh, doing some research so they can collaboratively work. Yeah, thank you. Is there an email address or a contact number that uh, we can uh, publish? Yeah, uh I think uh, they can uh, you can give my email address. Uh, I can type it in the chat box. Uh, so please. Yes. Because so, there are this... individual students who are who have already joined this uh, webinar because they are having a, a small research component also in the undergraduate curriculum as well as the the science students have joined here. So they also have uh, some research component in their undergraduate curriculum. So it will be beneficial for all of them. Yes, so I put my email address in the chat box. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Shiromani and uh, Mr. Bremalal, I have one question now. Uh, in both of your presentations, you have highlighted like uh, from 2022 to 2022, we had uh, Ladina years and uh, 2023, we, we are having again the El Nino years. So is there any way of uh, predicting these uh, beforehand? Yeah, actually, this uh, that's a, a very good. Uh, uh, the El Nino can predict, uh, I mean, at least three uh, uh, months in advance. Uh, but uh, this time also by um, like by March, it is predicted that by May there's a possibility uh, to uh, uh, El Nino reemerge uh, in the uh, Pacific Ocean. Uh, so uh, even our uh, outlook, uh, we have monsoon forum and we discuss about the climate outlook for Southwest monsoon. We uh, inform them that's a possibility. And right now, uh, the prediction is up to uh, J J uh, D uh, DJF, January, February, March, sorry, December, January, February. So it is predicted till December, January, February, uh, this event will, uh, uh, the uh, El Nino will last, but we don't know whether, because it's up to like, uh, to, this is, uh, they predicted up to six months. Uh, so uh, it might be last for another, like at least till uh, April. So if it is last for till next April, next April will be more warmer than this because uh, this time actually it was like developing stage, but once it uh, uh, was uh, fully established, it takes like uh, uh, five uh, overlapping three consecutive months, like May, June, July, July, mm -hmm. August, September, like that, uh, three, five consecutive months if uh, that, uh, Pacific sea surface temperatures are above 0.5 degrees. So then they consider it as a El Nino episode. 
So if it's El Nino episode, we feel more warm conditions. Like I remember in uh, 2020, uh, even in January, we experienced five degrees above normal temperatures. Even in January, it's warm. Uh, so uh, I think we have to be careful. Uh, that's yes. one reason we are actually um, organizing this uh, talk also, because uh, El Nino will be there. So we, even though now, uh, Southwest monsoon will establish, we can, um, it, the uh, defect can be a little bit reduced, but still mm -hmm. there's a possibility uh, for getting warmer conditions. Yeah, actually, uh, in, in, in the context of uh, vector-borne diseases as well, I think uh, these mosquitoes, uh, their uh, life cycle depends on temperature and uh, rainfall directly. So uh, if you overlap uh, these uh, high temperature events with the increase of uh, number of cases, I think we can have a very clear picture in the future as well. So th thank you for highlighting this, uh, uh, Dr. Shiromani. And one last question, most of the uh, general public uh, asking now, why these high temperatures at night particularly? Yeah, there can be two reasons for that. Uh, one, uh, especially when we have uh, like uh, southwest monsoon, uh, even in the month of May, low levels, we had southwesterly flow. So this flow will uh, move from the uh, ocean. So in uh, because ocean that uh, have very high specific heat capacity, it's uh, warm slowly and cool slowly, but land warms quickly, cools quickly. So night temp time, uh, lands are cooler and oceans are warmer. So when the wind uh, winds are blowing from ocean, so we get warm, uh, te temperatures that uh, one, another thing is the clouds if the uh, uh, sky is overcast then uh, the radiation emitted by the earth's surface will absorb by these clouds and re-emit towards the earth so that uh, uh, like uh, greenhouse gas uh, clouds also warms the uh, earth so th these are the two reasons yeah, I, another I, I, thing is I that know. high uh, sea surface temperature because it's kind of like our ocean is warm, so we can feel that warm. Thank right. you. Right. And I also would like to uh, add one more. Yes. So the other one is uh, the albedo, the surface albedo. So mm -hmm. especially you know that uh, uh, like uh, the city, so mm -hmm. the daytime uh, more radiation absorbed by you know that uh, uh, different materials like uh, some materials the albedo is very high, so more. Uh, albedo is very uh, yeah. so more heat absorbed by the daytime, like through that tar and others, mm -hmm. and nighttime, you know, that it emits as you know, that long wave radiation, infrared right. radiation. So, even nighttime, actually, uh, more cities are very warm uh, due to uh, the surface albedo. Right. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Sajit, I think uh, if there are no other questions, I think. Uh, Due to time constraints, we can uh, wrap up the uh, session. And um, I think if you, if anyone of you needs uh, any more information with the consent of uh, our two speakers, I can think we can also send some details. Uh, if you need any uh, evidence for this uh, about these uh, topics, and most probably in very near future, we will be conducting another similar uh, uh, webinar uh, on uh, health impacts, especially now this was uh, uh, sort of to get a, a basic idea about the uh, uh, evidence uh, behind this uh, warm uh, temperature and, uh, and to, uh, uh, to educate especially the medical practitioners as well as uh, the general public on the basics of uh, the these uh, science and uh, in the next episode most probably we will be uh, discussing in length about the health impacts uh, with our two eminent uh, speakers joining as well so uh, on behalf of uh, sri lanka medical uh, association uh, i would like to thank uh, dr shivamani jayawardena and mr premalal uh, for taking their time to uh, educate us and for the comprehensive presentations actually we learned a lot and I think we can continue this uh, discussion during the next uh, webinars as well. Uh, thank you for all the participants uh, for joining us as well. So under the uh, 
uh, subcommittee of uh, specialist committee of uh, disaster management and disaster resilience uh, we will be conducting uh, more webinars particularly targeted at general public as well so please do join us uh, we will be advertising all the uh, webinars and again thank you dr shiromani and uh, mr premalal for joining us and uh, a very good night to to you all thank you very much